Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe McBrady, and I'm the president and CEO of Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. And I want to thank you for joining us for our second annual community update. We had such a positive experience last year during our first update, we hope to make this an, an, an annual engagement. This public webinar not only gives us an opportunity to talk to you about our work, but also to listen to your questions, your concerns, and your interests. So that is the goal today. And I hope you will stick around after our remarks to participate in the question and answer session, because we really do want to hear what you have to say. So let's begin. I'd like to welcome Fred DeMarker, President and CEO of Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, to the microphone to start today's proceedings. Fred, over to you. Yes. 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 So, Fred might help. I think your microphone might be muted. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, and uh, let, let me start again by saying uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, bonsoir à tous. I want to start by acknowledging our commitment to healing and reconciliation, which is a responsibility that I personally and all of us at AECL take very seriously. For many people in Canada. The history of Indigenous people is one that invokes shame and sorrow. As we think about the land we stand on today, wherever we may be across Canada, we should take the opportunity to reflect on this dark part of Canada's history, to recognize its impacts on the lives of Indigenous peoples and communities today, and to work together to build a better future. In the city of Toronto, where I'm currently located, I acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. They are the traditional guardians of this land, and I acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory. For AECL and CNL, our commitment to Indigenous communities goes beyond just acknowledging the land, doing a land acknowledgement. We are also committed to respecting the rights of Indigenous peoples at all the sites where we operate and advancing reconciliation with these communities through respect, through collaboration, and through partnership. I'm excited to be here today to talk about the Chalk River Labs. And I can't talk about the labs without talking about the nuclear industry and specifically the future of the nuclear sector. I don't think I can remember a time when optimism and confidence in the nuclear industry has been so high. Yesterday's federal budget provided a very positive affirmation of the government's support for nuclear technology as a clean, non-emitting energy option to combat climate change. It's truly a time of hope. Hope that we can show the world what this technology, nuclear technology, can do to make us healthier, safer, and more resistant to climate change. There are two critical issues at work here. A desperate need to replace fossil fuel generation for the sake of the planet, and the increasing need to meet the demand for new sources of electricity. And maybe there's a third issue at play, renewed confidence in Canada's nuclear industry, confidence in the people who work at Canadian nuclear labs to be the innovators who will play a key role and in some instances lead this nuclear revival. Nuclear energy now provides about 10% of the world's electricity and that's going to grow. The World Nuclear Association estimates that this will more than double by 2050 to around 25%. That forecast means that AECL and Canadian nuclear labs must be ready. We saw this coming and we are ready. The Chalk River Labs have been, un uh, uh, the Chalk River Lab has been undergoing a massive transformation. And as it completes the projects currently underway, it's poised 
to rival any nuclear campus anywhere in the world. I've been excited to watch as AECL's $1.3 billion investment to revitalize our campus has rolled out to ensure that our facilities are ready to expand our leadership position in key areas of research while exploring new commercial opportunities. At AECL, we're ready with a plan to lead the way. First, we are doubling down on what we do well, investing in, in our existing capabilities, such as can do technology which displaces 40 megatons of CO2 annually in Canada alone. Hydrogen technology to further advance Canada's climate change agenda. Medical isotopes to improve the health of Canadians. And leveraging nuclear science to enhance national security. Along with CNL, we continue to support the Government of Canada through the Federal Nuclear Science and Technology Work Plan, with high levels of engagement across the 14 participating departments and agencies. We will continue our environmental duties, managing and reducing Canada's nuclear liabilities safely and efficiently. Next, we're also looking ahead to take the lead on nuclear innovation in Canada by enhancing cooperation across academic and research networks and industry end users and fostering international cooperation. And third, but most importantly, we continue to spark nuclear innovation to the public good. We are advancing research on cancer treatment helping to build sustainable clean energy systems, including leveraging our existing nuclear infrastructure and homegrown can-do technology. And we are enabling the advancement of novel technologies such as clean hydrogen, small modular reactors, and fusion. The last point I wanna talk about before passing it back to Joe is the competitive procurement model that we are launching to renew the contract for the management of CNL. As most people know, we operate under a government owned contractor operated model or GOCO, whereby AECL contracts the management of CNL to a private sector contractor. CNL has been managed since September of 2015 by Canadian National Energy Alliance or CNEA, a consortium made up of three partner companies, SNC Lavana, Jacobs Engineering, and Floor Federal Services under a contract that will expire in September of 2025. AECL is entering into a competitive process to continue the management and operation of CNL beyond that date. This process is built into the GOCO blueprint to periodically return to the nuclear community to make sure we have the best team in place to carry out the Canadian nuclear agenda. I want to emphasize here, this process will not affect ongoing work, projects, or priorities of Canadian nuclear labs. AECL sets priorities for CNL, and these are not expected to change with this procurement process. AECL's role is to oversee CNL's performance against the GOCO contract and support its priorities and those of the Government of Canada. Only a handful of individuals in senior management positions will be affected. No matter who ends up leading CNL, one thing stays constant. We will succeed because first, we have an engaged, committed, and uniquely skilled CNL workforce that's ready to meet the challenges ahead. Second, we have a solid plan to bring nuclear solutions to solve society's challenges, including to climate change. And third, we have the trust of our communities and the people of Canada to get the job done safely and efficiently. On this last point, I would like to express my gratitude to our host communities whose support is vital to our success. 
I began by recognizing the debt we owe indigenous peoples and acknowledging their close relationship with this land around us. I want to close by emph emphasizing that none of our work will progress without meaningful engagement with indigenous communities. AECL and CNL are committed to healing and reconciliation through listening, through respect, through meaningful action, and through long lasting relationships founded on trust. Thank you and miigwech. Back to you, Joe. Fred, thank you very much for those opening remarks. And again, good evening, everyone. Like Fred, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today for the community update. Since 2015, CNL has worked hard to identify what our role should be as Canada's National Nuclear Laboratory. We are home to some of the most unique nuclear facilities in the world, as well as some of the best scientific minds. How do we leverage these resources to better serve Canadians? That question has been at the heart of our planning these past few years as we pursue a new era of scientific discovery at the Chalk River Laboratories. I am proud to say we now have some answers to that question. Last fall, CNL launched a new corporate strategy known as Vision 2030, which charts an ambitious new direction for CNL. Our work is now organized into three priorities, restoring and protecting the environment, advancing clean energy for today and for tomorrow, and contributing to the health of Canadians. More importantly, the new strategy identifies what we view as our central role in the Canadian nuclear landscape. CNL will serve as a national resource to all levels of government, Canada's nuclear industry, the private sector, and the academic communities working in partnership with others to help advance innovative Canadian products and services toward real world use. That includes carbon free energy, cancer treatments and diagnoses, non-proliferation technologies, and waste management solutions. So this is our vision, and I encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to read it, because it will now define what we do as a company. And in the years to come, you will see more evidence about how CNL is delivering value, driving innovation, supporting the industry across the country through the following areas, serving as a national applied science and engineering laboratory, working with industry to solve current problems and incubate future innovations, collaborating with academia and helping to develop Canada's workforce, and finally, fulfilling public needs on behalf of the Government of Canada. But Vision 2030 is not just about what we do. It is about and how we do it. It's how we work and, how we, and who we are. This new strategy encompasses the modernization of our projects and our programs, but also our workforce, our workforce policies, and our organizational structure. That starts by making sure that the inclusion of indigenous knowledge helps to improve the way we work and to build trust and understanding between CNL staff and indigenous people. This is why CNL has developed a reconciliation action plan, which will help pursue positive relationships with indigenous nations and organizations, and it will help identify internal improvements for us at CNL. For example, we are about to release a new Indigenous Relations Procurement Strategy, which will help extend economic opportunities to Indigenous businesses. And there is much more. We are working to better engage our local communities through new initiatives that include a summer science program and an expanded school program that invites local students to tour our campus. We are also pursuing closer ties with Canada's academic community and have signed agreements with five leading Canadian universities, which will help establish a pipeline of young and talented researchers, not just for CNL and the nuclear industry, but for Canada more broadly. And this is something we as a nation desperately need. You may not have noticed, but CNL is growing. Today, our workforce may be the largest that it has ever been. If you include our contractors, we have over 4,000 people now working for CNL across Canada, and we have hundreds of vacancies that we still need to fill. That growth has a positive impact on our region 
because it means communities will flourish as well. Finally, Vision 2030 includes the revitalization of the Chalk River Laboratories, which is being transformed into a modern and sustainable new campus. By March of next year, CNL will have safely removed approximately 120 buildings and other structures from the Chalk River site. In their place, brand new research laboratories and modern buildings are steadily coming to life, giving us the facilities we need to pursue next generation nuclear research and establishing a campus that operates in harmony with the environment. In particular, there are two exciting new facilities that are currently under construction, which are at the center for our vision for a modern and a sustainable campus. The first, the Science Collaboration Center, will change the way we work. Once complete, this facility will serve as a central planning and collaboration space for CNL's research programs and will feature flexible, modern office space for approximately 450 employees. And it's almost done. We expect to occupy this facility by late summer of this year. The second, the Advanced Nuclear Materials Research Facility, or the ANMRC, will be one of the largest nuclear research facilities ever built in Canada. Scheduled to be completed by March of two, or in 2028, the ANMRC will be a 10,000 square meter facility that will feature 23 laboratories, accommodate 160 employees, and consolidate key capabilities across our campus. And it will support Canada's clean energy goals by providing services that are critical to the long-term reliability of Canada's nuclear fleet of power reactors and the development of next generation nuclear technology. In just a few minutes, some of our folks will give you more details on some of the exciting capital programs and pioneering research that, will, that are taking place throughout the Chalk River campus. For now, I will close by saying that the future looks bright for CNL. We have an exciting vision for the campus, and it comes with brand new facilities and brand new laboratories. That means new research projects and research programs. It means new jobs and new economic opportunities for local suppliers and for businesses. And we believe it will once again put us on the map as an organization that can change the world. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this, this evening. What we're going to do now is have some presentations in uh, several of our key mission areas to be able to provide you an update on the good work that we have delivered over the previous year and to provide a look ahead at what we are planning for the years to come. At this point, I would like to invite Monica Steedman, our Vice President for Environmental Remediation Management, to the podium to discuss our progress and the future of our remediation program. Monica, over to you. Thank you, Joe, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say just how very proud I am of the team and the work that we've accomplished over this last year to disposition the legacy waste and remediate the site. We've got so many projects underway. It's, a, it's just a hive of activity. Um, but I just wanted to give you a sample of what we're doing here so you can understand the breadth uh, of what we're trying to achieve. So first of all, with high hazard remediation, the picture here just shows us uh, removing an active storage tank. And then I think you can see that we've demolished uh, the form, former machine shop and warehouse. Uh, and that facility has then moved into at one of the new builds uh, that, that we've uh, uh, commissioned here. We've commenced the full operations in our new sort and segregation facility, ensuring that all that legacy waste is processed to meet modern standards. Now, what does that mean? I think if you think about your home and your sort and segregation of waste at home, what we're looking here is to minimize disposal, where we do have disposal that it goes to the right path and we recycle as much as possible. And talk about, about recycling, the Twin Lakes uh, picture that you see is our soil storage area. So this is when we're excavating from site, we store the material for future reuse in projects. With regards to environmental remediation, we've safely over-drilled, over grouted and decommissioned 37 deep uh, boreholes this last year. We also collaborate with s &T, so we retrieved radium-226 so that could support the development of their alpha cancer therapy. We continue 
lots of characterization and planning. And we've safely transferred the last significant quantity of highly enriched uranium that was eligible for repatriation to the US, where they will re reuse it and we've reduced the liability for Canada. Moving on to this coming year, with regards to the next steps towards a decision on NSDF, as well as final written submissions, the Commission has posted they will allow final oral submissions by Indigenous nations and communities, and this is scheduled for June 27, 2023. We're also getting ready to receive Whiteshell's ILW. We've been making space in order to ensure that we have sufficient storage uh, for their, uh, their fuel. The, we are nearing completion on readiness to receive these shipments uh, using our new Optimus flasks. We will continue the internal decommissioning in our high hazard buildings. This has lots of work to do. Um, it will take us a number of years um, to be able to complete that work. This year, with regards to building demolition, we will look at the initially at the controlled area machine shop, uh, the tool crib and decontamination centre. With the amount of work that is underway, we're also looking at building our own capacity with regards to waste characterisation and, and making sure that we can do that as our work site ramps up. I mentioned fuel consolidation, where we'll be looking to consolidate uh, fuel from Jean T and White Shell Laboratories and store here until there is a broader uh, Canadian solution. With regards to the vision moving forward, we've got many projects underway, as I said, and I could talk about the cask facility, I think the tritiated heavy water management, just to name a few. But I really wanted to highlight, sort of moving forward into the future, the work that we're doing on planning potential options to approach the waste management area B. We're looking at a program of work to retrieve the material and then looking at the legacy waste uh, to, to uh, condition, process and store that until disposal facilities are available in Canada. As we move through this project and thinking about it, we will be engaging with the public and Indigenous communities. And this project will be here for a long time. It's going to take decades uh, for us to be able to do this work. We look forward to this coming year and the work that is ahead of us. Thank you. Monica, thank you uh, very much. Certainly an awful lot of stuff going on in the, in the environmental remediation world. And I think it's really an exciting time. Monica touched on a couple points, which I think are, are really important. Our environmental remediation mission will continue for decades. And that mission, the ultimate goal is to clean up the Chalk River site. And it is so important that we continue to, to be able to enable that mission and to be able to accomplish that because it's the right thing to do for the community and it's the right thing to do for, for the environment. So Monica, thank you very much. The work that the, you and your team have done are really critical enablers to this continued science and technology mission of our laboratories. And this sets the stage perfectly for our next speaker, Dr. Jeff Griffin, who is the Vice President of Science and Technology here at uh, CNL. So Jeff, over to you. So thank you very much, Joe. So I'd like to start like Monica by uh, saying how proud I am to be here tonight and uh, have the opportunity to, to talk for just a few minutes and give uh, all of you a, a small taste of some of the work that we're doing in science and technology. So let me start with uh, just a, a bit of the, about some of the key accomplishments over the past year. So first I'll start with a, a really important one, I think for us, the one we're really proud of is the Good Laboratory Practices Facility Recognition. So GLP, Good Laboratory Practices, recognition uh, is really going to be foundational to help us in the health area where we can do uh, uh, preclinical studies working with radiopharmaceutical companies. So this complements very nicely the work that we're doing that you'll hear more about shortly uh, to get into uh, back into medical radioisotope production. So this is for our biological research facility and it's something that just occurred in the last year and I really look forward to the opportunities it's going to give us as we go forward. We continue to support Canada's na uh, nuclear fleet, uh, the, the utilities across Canada and actually internationally with CANDUs, as Fred outlined, uh, uh, Chalk River is the home, uh, the, the development uh, place for CANDU technology and that's a really critical part of our mission is to ensure that we continue to support the, operate, the safe operation and continued life 
uh, expectancy of the, the current fleet. And actually, if we, you know, as things grow going forward, we will be right there with them, working with them. Joe outlined at the beginning of uh, the presentation how we've uh, engaged with a number of Canadian universities. And we, this is a really important program for us that we've actually focused quite a bit on in the last year. It's a new academic partnership program. We did sign uh, MOUs with five universities across Canada. Uh, I think others will probably follow, but uh, we're really looking to try to formalize a relationship as a national lab. I think there's a lot that we should be doing with universities. We have an opportunity to create uh, new you know, innovations, uh, advanced research in some key areas, as well as introduce students to some of the key needs in nuclear science and technology that'll, that'll help carry us into the future. Fred talked about hydrogen and the importance of hydrogen as a key part of our decarbonization. And recognizing that, we at CNL hosted a Canadian hydrogen safety workshop to sort of help industry and uh, government get together and understand how we can work through some of the challenges and opportunities that are out there in the hydrogen uh, uh, infrastructure world. And we think that this is really going to help set the pace um, for hydrogen uh, across Canada. I talked about the academic partnerships, but we've expanded research partnerships with industry and communities as well. We're going out in communities and trying to work with them. We're trying to find industries that we can work with to advance technologies, to put deploy technologies, to demonstrate uh, uh, small scale technologies and, and help get things, help advance things across the so-called valley of death that you sometimes see for new technologies. Cybersecurity is a big, a big uh, factor in the world today, and this is something that we've uh, really greatly expanded our efforts at CNL. Uh, this past year, we've been focused on uh, holding a number of cyber incident response exercises where we work with industry, other national labs, uh, some in the U.S., and uh, to focus on the cyber security for operational situations. And we've held two exercises in the past year, and we see this continuing as we go forward. And then lastly, in, the, in terms of the past year, I want to mention our uh, Canadian Nuclear Research Initiative, or SCENERY program. This is something we started in 2019. It's uh, an effort to take the capabilities that Canada has invested in here, the knowledge and uh, facilities that we have, and reach out to industry and help industry through a cost-sharing uh, exercise to help develop some of their technologies or demonstrate their technologies and help advance them. Now, this past year, we had a, another call as our fourth one, and we had uh, eight uh, responses, which is really quite strong, and uh, uh, we're really pleased with that. And in fact, the program has grown so, uh, so well over this past year that we've expanded beyond just the primary energy focus, which is where the first few years have been, to a scenery health program, and we expect to see similar growth in that over the next couple of years. So if I look ahead, I've, I talked about the hydrogen uh, safety workshop that we held. We had such strong a response, positive response from that, that we're actually uh, taking that and building a hydrogen safety center concept. It'll be, it's not a, a facility per se at this stage, it's really more of a, a virtual gathering, uh, a hub, if you will, that allows uh, regulators, industry, industry groups, laboratories like us to get together and work through, as I said earlier, some of the opportunities and challenges that'll face us as we as we move forward more strongly with hydrogen and the hydrogen infrastructure. We continue to advance the research and capabilities via the Federal Nuclear Science and Technology Work Plan, working in the FNST program, as we call it, working closely with the 14 federal agencies to uh, advance uh, development in some of the key areas that range from radiopharmaceuticals, uh, um, medical studies, um, uh, clean energy opportunities, hydrogen, uh, all the way to national and nuclear security. Through our partnerships with universities, we see an expansion of uh, opportunities for uh, post-secondary and graduate students. We expect to put a number of programs in place in the coming months. Uh, these will range from summer research programs to things like um, uh, research fellowships, internships, perhaps even funded chairs at some point in the future. We're going to continue building on our cyber incident response exercises. We've seen a lot of interest from industry and the opportunity for us to help them understand what some of the risks are and how to respond to some of those risks. So working with industry, doing training, working with other labs, 
I th we think we're really building a, an important and contributing an important aspect to uh, cybersecurity uh, for industry here in Canada. And lastly, we see an expanding workforce. So Joe talked about this earlier, but in the science and technology area alone, we've hired over 120 in the last 12 months, and we expect that to continue very strongly into the future. There's a lot of work coming our way, and this is very exciting. So if I turn to the last slide and a vision, uh, S&T's part in enabling Canada's future. So you'll hear in a few minutes about the new capabilities such as the Advanced Nuclear Materials Research Center that we're building. Those are being built, these new capabilities that we talked about are being built to help expand the capabilities to really better employ the capabilities that we have here at CNL and allowing us to reach out and do more and have a larger impact. So we're really excited about that. We're taking this idea of partnerships and moving it forward into the centers of research excellence in key areas. We want to work with industry. We want to work with uh, universities and colleges. We want to bring in people in key areas where it makes sense and, and build those kinds of centers and hubs that can really help advance uh, against key challenges. You're going to hear more in a few minutes about our uh, uh, demonstration siting of a small modular reactor here when Ali Siddiqui talks about that. And that's certainly going to be an important part of what we do here at CNL. And then we want to take that even further into a clean energy demonstration and deployment uh, initiative. We want to ultimately have a park or uh, facilities that allow us to demonstrate uh, combined technologies, uh, um, associated technologies that work for clean energy uh, and allow us to demonstrate and, and help advance these things toward deployment. And so Ali will talk about that in a few minutes. And then lastly, but certainly not least important, you'll hear more from Ron Mueller in just a few minutes, but we want to talk about, uh, we want to focus on radiopharmaceutical R&D, medical isotope production. We've done a lot of work here over the last few years to really advance the capabilities in that area, and it's very exciting times coming forward. So with that, I'll uh, stop and turn it back to you, Joe. Thank you. Jeff, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I think, I hope that you can see that there is an awful lot going on with our science and technology organization here at, at CNL in the support, not only of Canada's nuclear industry, but also of its clean energy industry. We'll let uh, Ram Mueller talk a little bit about actini actinium and isotopes in a bit, but I think it's really important when we look at trying to help Canada solve climate change issues with energy security, that we are a key component of that. And I think for our communities to understand that you, that you have a valued portion of that supply chain, of that R&D chain sitting right here in the Ottawa Valley. You know, we are looking to conduct the, the first construction and operation of the first micro reactor potentially in North America. That's a big deal. And that is a, re that, that, sets the stage in the facilities and the people uh, that we have at Chalk River will enable that, uh, that, that uh, dream to come to life, hopefully. So a lot of really good stuff going on, and I just want to thank Jeff and all his people for that. I want to, at this point, uh, turn it over to uh, Brian Savage now. Brian will uh, provide an update on the Advanced uh, Nuclear Materials Research Center. Following Brian, uh, Ram Mueller, our Vice President of Isotope uh, of the Isotope business, will provide an update on our work in Actinium-225, which is a promising new weapon in the fight against cancer. And finally, Ali Siddiqui, the head of our Advanced Reactors Division, will catch us up on what I just touched on a little bit, but far more detail on bringing a small modular reactor to the Chalk River campus. So Brian, over to you. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm also very proud to be here this evening. Well, why am I proud? I'm proud because I have the opportunity to, to provide an update on one, one of our most exciting projects, the ANMRC, Advanced Nuclear Materials Research Center. ANMRC is very important to CNL as it forms the cornerstone of our capital revitalization program here at the Chalk River site. It's in support of the scientific mission and it will replace several aging facilities that have been in service since the 1950s and 1960s. 
We are currently in detailed design and early construction. So, what do we do at ANMRC? Well, ANMRC is first and foremost a science facility. So in a science facility, we do research, we do testing, and we do experiments on irradiated materials. ANMRC is uniquely equipped with the kit to perform such scientific activities. We have hot cells, we have glove boxes, and we have laboratories. So what are hot cells? Well, if you can imagine, a hot cell is a small room with thick concrete walls, uh, small windows with thick glass. Irradiated materials are inside and workers are outside looking in through the thick glass windows and manipulating and controlling the test equipment and irradiated materials with what we call manipulators, which are really robotic arms. Glove boxes are similar, except smaller. Instead of manipulators, they use their own hands with gloves that are attached to the walls of the glove box. Laboratories, the NMRC is equipped with multi-purpose laboratories, which can be reconfigured on the fly to perform a variety of tasks in support of the scientific mission. So, this is the NMRC project team. Why do we show this slide? Well, we're quite proud of the approach we're taking on the contracting strategy. We're using something that's very innovative here at CNL and in Canada and the nuclear industry um, to boot. We're using something called Integrated Project Delivery or IPD for short. IPD is something that I would, that is synonymous with collaboration, um, where CNL with nine other partners collaborate on, on achieving a common goal. And that goal is the construction of a modern state-of-the-art scientific facility while at the same time providing value for the Canadian taxpayer. You'll notice that from the logos on the slide in front of you that you'll recognize many of them as being from the local Renfrew County area, Ottawa Valley and the broader Ontario area. All of the companies, all of the partners have a strong footprint in Ontario. Currently, we have between 50 and 75 workers on site. That's expected to increase to between 200 and 300 as construction ramps up over the next couple of years. So a couple of quick facts by the numbers. We talked about labs. We have 23 labs, uh, 12 hot cells, and the manipulators I talked about, the robotic arms, we have 42. Um, that will also require about 50,000 cubic meters of concrete, 40,000 uh, cubic meters of excavation, excavated material, and 4,000 tons of steel. Interestingly, about 20% of the steel fabrication will be uh, constructed off-site and, and shipped to the site in, modular, in a modular form. So where are we to date? Well, the photo at the left shows an important milestone that we just achieved recently at one of our partners' fabrication uh, facilities in Cambridge, Ontario. That's Eclipse Automation, where we cut the first steel for our hot cell formwork. On the lower right, you'll see the output of detailed design. That's at our building information model, which is called BIM. That's the, all of the engineering is done with modern state-of-the-art engineering tools, such as BIM. And the output of the BIM is the animation you see in the top right hand corner, which shows the construction of the facility. I only wish it were that simple. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, construction progress. Here at the site, it's, it's, we're very busy. And you can see uh, it's, we're in the early construction phase where we're in the midst of a, a very large excavation where in, in preparation for the uh, commencement of the construction of the foundation, we're excavating about 30 feet into the ground. Um, um, surrounding that excavation is what we call secant shoring. You can see that in the photo in the upper left-hand corners. The secant shoring is a way to hold back the earth so workers can work below on the foundation safely without fear of collapse. We'll be finished that work within the next couple of months and where we will then start preparations for our first concrete pours. It's an exciting time to be within the capital program. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Ron Mueller, the Vice President of our Isotope business. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll start off saying um, 
I'm very excited, very glad, and very proud to be presenting to you our latest work in the, in the innovation for the next generation of medical isotopes. I'll start off by illustrating the promise of actinium-225 and targeted alpha therapy with this scan, um, a set of scans. So on the left, you see a very diseased patient and a PET scan of the uh, diseased patient, um, a body full, ridden with cancer, um, metas metastasized, and, uh, and, and the patient undergoes their first treatment with actinium, and you see the first cycle has a huge impact on the disease, and it's uh, definitely uh, getting rid of the disease. And there's two more doses which are given over a period of several months, and as you'll see in the scan um, in, of January 18, five, six months from the time the first uh, scan was taken, the patient is almost disease-free, and continues to be disease-free without any treatment for uh, in the uh, scan which shows in May 2018. So that's the opportunity actinium brings and that a field of targeted alpha therapy brings to the world and to the uh, patient community. However, that's not without its challenges. The current supply is not sufficient to complete the clinical trials for over 100 drugs which are waiting in the pipeline to, uh, to uh, get commercialized and go through the trials. Five years ago, CNL stepped up to meet this challenge. So we became one of the three companies in the world, or three uh, entities in the world, who could produce actinium, and we continue to keep that uh, a position as the world still is waiting for more actinium and more supplies to come in. And we haven't stopped since then. We, we continue to invest in our R&D and our science and development um, in the fields of physics, engineering, chemistry, and biology. As Jeff mentioned, uh, we're, we're partnering with pharma industry to, to develop the drugs and to help uh, the industry develop the drugs in the field of uh, targeted alpha therapy. And we're doing that in a phased manner and a very risk, with a risk measured approach. In, in, in that, uh, we have a smaller capacity today. We've proven our ability to produce and, and commercialize and sell uh, actinium isotope today. What we are working on right now is with a newer technology. We're trying to commercialize a newer technology um, with a new route for production of actinium, wherein uh, we are partnering with an entity who would uh, be able to radiate our targets designed here at Chalk um, and bring, bring those targeted, uh, targets back uh, into our facility, process them, and ship it to the customers. And this would be at an interim and, uh, and a medium scale and uh, coming in the medium term in terms of time. Long term, we have plans to further scale up and build a facility, uh, our own facility, uh, with an accelerator and a processing uh, uh, facility uh, to produce commercial scales to uh, meet the global demand. What we are doing with this new technology, um, uh, we are de we're deploying, deploying this new technology is basically we are taking uh, what material, what is uh, considered today as medical waste, uh, sitting in various waste management repositories all over the world, including chalk, um, and in lots of uh, medical uh, hospital bunker, uh, waste bunkers, uh, in form of uh, needles, in form of uh, spent needles of radium from the uh, past several decades. So we use that uh, radium source, we extract those radium, and convert them into productive targets to be used in, uh, in the cyclotron, wherein they get bombarded to produce actinium. It's a very sustainable solution in that what we, what we bring as starting material, we are able to actually uh, reclaim and reuse 90% of what went in as raw material with, with only a very small fraction being used. So we are almost looking at a very slowly uh, depleting resource to produce actinium. So in summary, uh, I'll, I'll close off uh, with, with these thoughts and these points. Um, um, it, I shared with you today, actinium has the potential to transform the uh, cancer treatment and address unmet medical needs today. The world does not have enough actinium needed to realize this medical potential. Canada and CNL have successfully stepped up to take on this challenge. CNL has made investments in technology and uh, has recently hit very uh, key success milestones in this area. CNL can advance this technology in a very sustainable manner. Last but not the least, this is an opportunity for Canada and for Chalk River to once again be the leader in the field of medical isotopes. Thank you. At this point, I will welcome my colleague, um, Ali Siddiqui, 
uh, who's the head of directorate for advanced reactors to talk about the next project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ram. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to give an update today on what uh, is looking to be the very first microreactor to be sited uh, in Canada. Uh, you can see in the picture here uh, the Chalk River site, uh, and that's going to be the home for this, uh, this first reactor deployment. SMRs are an opportunity for Canada to decarbonize. Today, there are a number of different reactor designs that are being considered in different use cases across the country. We talk about these reactors in three different streams. Uh, stream one is on-grid reactors. Uh, these are on the larger end of SMRs and are intended to plug into the current electrical grid. Uh, there are examples underway now, uh, including the BWRX 300 project uh, at the Darlington site that OPG is managing. Uh, stream two is advanced reactors. These are next generation reactors, typically not using water as a coolant, that go to higher temperatures. These promise the opportunity for electrical production as well as uh, process heat used to decarbonize industry. New Brunswick Power is currently working with ARC and with Moltex, two different designs. Uh, and, and finally, Stream 3 are off-grid reactors. These are quite a bit smaller and intended for uh, applications such as mines or other remote sites, including potentially uh, remote communities that are currently reliant on diesel fuel. Bruce Power, OPG, uh, Saskatchewan Research Council, and of course, Chalk River Labs uh, through CNL is all, uh, are all locations that are considering these reactors. So how is CNL enabling SMRs and advanced reactors? Well, there's a number of activities underway. Uh, the Federal Nuclear Science and Technology uh, Program is doing research right now uh, to enable SMR development and deployment, uh, answering questions to provide detailed science to the regulator and to policymakers. We're also working closely with industry through our scenery program, Canadian Nuclear Research Initiative, making available the unique facilities and expertise that are available here in the lab to uh, solve technical challenges and help these uh, vendors move towards deployment. We're further developing our Clean Energy Demonstration Innovation and Research Initiative, or CEDAR Initiative, which paves the way for energy technologies uh, providing research, but also a demonstration platform to show how these technologies uh, can work together in an integrated system. And finally, uh, our SMR demonstration siting, where we're hosting a demonstration SMR on a CNL managed site. So the the first reactor that we intend to have here at the Chalk River Labs is GFP's Micromodular Reactor. It's an exciting technology, so I'm going to take a moment just to talk about that. Uh, it's a 5 megawatt electric design, uh, 15 megawatts thermal. This is using a high temperature gas cooled reactor concept using helium as the coolant. In fact, there's no water in the, uh, in the coolant at all. Uh, it uses an air cooler as the ultimate heat sink. It incorporates uh, advanced uh, passive safety systems, inherent safety in the design, and plans for extended operation on a single fuel load, uh, upwards of 10 years. The design is based on established gas-cooled reactor technologies uh, with some innovations in the fuel design. The reactor itself will sit below grade uh, with additional outbuildings, including a, a visitor center available on the site. To be clear, uh, GFP, Global First Power is the licensee and operator for this reactor, uh, not CNL. Uh, CNL is providing a host site and some ancillary services. As far as progress on the site itself, uh, GFP has identified a preferred site in our, our parking lot uh, and geotechnical investigations have been completed. We are currently in stage three negotiations, essentially uh, lease negotiations about the land arrangements and about services and energy use. Uh, CNL buildings that are being constructed today are net zero ready. And so we look forward to the potential to use the energy from this SMR to further decarbonize our operations on the Chalk River site. GFP continues to progress their licensing uh, with the license to prepare site currently uh, under review by the regulator and uh, are working towards uh, preparing their environmental assessment. 
Uh, certainly over the last number of years and what will continue for many years to come is community and Indigenous engagement, uh, which is a crucial part of this project. And the target operational date for this reactor is, is fast approaching uh, with 2027 to 2028. Thank you very much. Helene, thanks so very much. And also thanks to Ram and uh, Brian for those very informative updates on some of our really key projects that we have underway uh, here at Chalk River uh, at this point in time. And I hope for, for our audience's sake, you can really kind of get a, a sense for how vibrant this laboratory is, I think, re-becoming. We have taken the, the mission of the NRU and medical isotope production in the past in nuclear science. When the NRU shut down, we have reimagined what Chalk River is going to do and be able to provide as a benefit to the Canadian people and really the, the world population uh, uh, as well. So at this point in time, uh, I think we're going to turn it over to uh, our Director of Communication, Philip Compass. Philip is going to uh, provide us with questions that uh, have come in from, from the audience. And we look forward with, uh, with the folks who have just uh, spoken with you and some folks that we have uh, also uh, on our staff available to answer uh, some of those questions that, uh, that are coming in. So again, thank you. Absolutely, and, uh, and thank you, Joe, for passing that over. We do have a number of folks online to take your questions, uh, and, uh, and please do submit those, and we'll take them as they come in. Uh, this is a rare opportunity to connect with some, some leaders in the industry, so please, uh, please get those questions in. Uh, the first question we will direct to Fred DeMarker, uh, and, and Fred, the question is asking about uh, last evening's budget, and, and what might that signal for Canada's nuclear sector, or for CNL, or for ACL? What do you make of, of the recent budget? Well, it was really exciting to uh, uh, hang on. I I don't know why I'm muted. Oh, am I off mute, Phil? Just confirming. Yes, you're fine. Okay. Yeah, it was really exciting to see the uh, the budget come out and so strongly uh, supportive of uh, of nuclear. I, I mean, it was supportive of nuclear writ large for the whole country large reactors, small reactors, refurbished reactors. The, 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 the government made, a, a, in my mind, a very clear statement that it was ready to, uh, to uh, recognize that nuclear is an important part of the solution to climate change, uh, an important contributor to not emitting technology. Now, what that means is, as we uh, expand the use of nuclear and, and get more into it, uh, you the, the, there will be a, um, a natural amount of work that comes to the lab. We are developing new technologies. The lab today plays a central role in helping to develop those new technologies. It plays a central role in helping to sustain existing technologies. And the, the, uh, the, the contribution of the lab is vital as we expand the use of nuclear technology. So what does it mean for CNL? It means that CNL will be playing a vital role in helping to enable all these new nuclear technologies that are a, uh, a solution to climate change. So that's what the budget means to me. It's a very positive affirmation and a and very positive news for the lab going forward, as well as for nuclear for the nuclear community writ large, and for uh, climate uh, climate change. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, that response, Fred. Uh, the next question is is going. I'll start with Joe, but perhaps there are others on the table that might want to jump in. Uh, and Joe, you indicated that CNL is growing in terms of its workforce. Uh, do you foresee that proceeding? And are there particular areas or skill sets that we might be looking for? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. And and the the answer is yes, we are growing. Uh, we mentioned that we have about four thousand folks across uh, CNL campuses uh, today. Uh, but we also have about five or uh, I guess about 500 vacancies that we're working to fill. And those, those uh, cross the gambit of uh, different skill sets uh, from our, our support workers to who are doing decommissioning to waste specialists to science and technology folks, researchers, uh, security folks. We've, uh, you know, we, we looked at an increase for, for our, our functional areas. 
Uh, certainly our work with universities is, is trying to increase our number of uh, in, uh, researchers here on site. And we expect that that will continue to grow. As, as Fred mentioned, I think it's a, it's a, a kind of a good you know, lead in with, uh, with the, uh, I think very positive federal budget uh, in talking about the support for nuclear uh, we are Canada's national nuclear laboratory, and we expect that you know s work at some point will come to us to support the nuclear industry, whether it's large nuclear, whether it's small modular reactors, uh, or uh, processing or heavy water uh, reprocessing. So we expect that this will be good for us. Uh, that is what we have looked at in our planning going forward. But you know we have a very steady. Uh, amount of decommissioning work that will continue uh, across, as, as we mentioned earlier, decades. Uh, and we expect that the, not only will we uh, continue to grow, but the jobs that we are going to look to hire in are going to increase in uh, technology uh, capabilities. And if there's a, other folks on the panel that want to handle that one as well, maybe Dr. Griffin from the S&T perspective. Well, yeah, uh, I completely support what you said. As, uh, as, as I mentioned in, when I was uh, presenting earlier, we've, we're actively hiring an S&T. Uh, the areas, of course, there's a nuclear laboratory. There's a lot in radiochemistry, but also chemical engineering, nuclear engineering, just a lot of different areas, program managers even. So uh, it's just uh, it's going to be important for us, and it's actually a real challenge uh, for us to get enough people in to support the missions that we see coming in front of us. So it's, it's, it's a great time to be in. It's a winner's problem right now, but it's one we've got to work on. Okay, thank you, Dr. Griffin. Thank you, Joe. Uh, the next questions are about ANMRC, and I have a few in the queue. So, uh, uh, Brian, we'll, we'll, we'll start over in, in your direction. And I'll, it's, it's two-pronged. So the first question, what is a hot cell? Uh, and the second question is, when will ANMRC be built in, and commissioned and up and running? So the second question is the easier one. Uh, 2028, uh, the plan is for the NMRC to be in service. The hot cell, the hot cell is a, a special self-contained laboratory. I, I tried to describe it earlier with the thick concrete walls, heavy glass windows where workers do experiments and tests on irradiated material inside. Uh, the purpose of the thick walls is to protect the workers outside from the from the radiation. Um, not sure if that answers the question. I can add one thing to it. It's sure. okay. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge to work on a hot cell because it is a laboratory, but you, because of the thick glass and all that, you have to use manipulators. So it's a special skill. <laughs> okay, and while I have you on the, on the hot mic, Dr. Griffin, uh, the, the question here is asking, is there a robust plan in place to ensure there's no gap in hot cell availability? With the new one coming on, and I guess some of our aging facilities, is um, there a plan is there to a, ensure a robust plan in place to ensure what? To ensure there are no gap in our hot cell capabilities. Oh yes, absolutely. So that's actually working in concert with uh, with Brian and others on the site. We have a, a bridging function for the facilities we have now. Uh, of course, as uh, ANMRC comes comes online, we'll we'll work that. Uh, we can't afford a gap. Uh, we we won't have one. We'll work through that. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, we're going to change gears a little bit. There are some questions coming uh, coming around the SMR field. So this next question I'll direct over to uh, Amy Goshling uh, from AECL. Now, Amy, the question is asking, um, why SMRs, why now, uh, and why perhaps why not a more immediately deployable technology, uh, wind or solar, for example? Why SMR? Okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. Fred, I think uh, maybe we have your mic open there. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Okay, so the question was, why is ACL choosing SMRs? And, and, and we've not done this in isolation. The reports in the industry are very clear. They're coming out worldwide. That in fact, the challenge with the climate change is going to require 
all forms of energy to increase their output drastically. That includes wind, it includes solar, it includes nuclear. And don't forget that wind and solar are in intermittent power sources, and they're going to need some base load power to keep the, uh, keep the energy on when we need it most. Don't forget, Canada has many locations that are still heavily dependent on coal and other high carbon emitting sources. And those areas need to keep the heat on in winter without fail. So as the megawatts from wind and solar increase, so does the need for a base load source of energy and SMRs can fill that gap and play that role. Why else are we sure about SMRs? Because we're confident in the Canadian supply chain. We're confident in our domestic abilities in Canada that we've grown over decades. We are confident that we are a tier one nuclear nation and can do this safely and securely for our nation. And why else are we choosing SMRs? Because the scale of the challenge is so extreme that we can't afford to pick and choose. We support wind, we support solar, but we are also going to do our very best to support nuclear. And Canada will be first. We will do this on time. We are The world is watching us. We are seen as a leader in SMR space. And as Ali mentioned, GFP reactor will be up and running uh, by 27, 2027, 2028. So this can happen in time and it, and it will. And don't forget, Chalk River Labs is not just working on SMRs. We're working on all technologies that can help fight climate change, fusion, hydrogen, low carbon fuels, just to name a few. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, that uh, response, Amy. And I am keeping with the theme of, of small modular reactors. And we have a question coming in for Yas Deening uh, of Global First Power. He's joined us online as well. And the question reads, Yas, uh, what's next for the GFP project? What should we expect to see over the coming year? Yeah, uh, thanks, Philip. So it's uh, Yas Dean from Global First Power. And um, so, so the, our next major milestone that's coming up is our uh, submission of our environmental impact statement and our license to prepare site. And so right now we are, we are through the far, we're moving through the final stages of review and we'll be sitting, uh, submitting that to the regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission uh, at the end of Q2 uh, of this year. And so that kicks off a, an external review process and with hearings to follow the, the following year. And, and in the meantime, in the background, we're also continuing to progress our design with our, our technology vendor, uh, UltraSafe Nuclear Corporation. And, um, and we will continue to progress that design as we get ready for the next stage in licensing, which is a license to construct and a license to operate, which follows uh, in uh, late 2025. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to switch back, uh, change topics again. We're looking towards the waste and decommissioning file. Uh, and the question I'm going to direct to Monica, uh, and the question is asking, what's the plan B if NSDF doesn't proceed? I don't want to preclude the, the decision that's coming. What's the plan B? Okay, thank you for that. Well, first of all, I think I'd like to say is that we're confident in the solution moving forward um, and the science and uh, capabilities of the organization uh, to do that. And I think also I'd just like to state that we believe that it is necessary with regards to actually, uh, you know, looking at the, the, the waste that is, the legacy waste that is at this site to put it into that safer state. As far as plan B goes, I think that will be a matter for looking at the time, what the actual decision is, uh, the reasons for that, and taking that path forward. Okay, thank you for that, Monica. And keeping with the waste theme, uh, we'll look to Alistair McDonald uh, at ACL for the next question. Uh, and Alistair, it might be shared as well with CNL. And the individual is asking, uh, what about the intermediate and, and high level wastes if NSDF is going to take the low level? Intermediate level waste is a uh, safely stored on site, and uh, we continue to do that. Um, we've yeah, also looking at uh, so we are only struggling with the living cost for a second. Sorry, we're uh, we're struggling with our audio here because we're using. Turn me back 
Okay, so p perhaps, Alistair, while the audio gets sorted out on your end, perhaps we can defer to, uh, to Megan Vickard. She's online. Megan, so same question. What's the path forward on intermediate and high-level wastes? Sure thing. Can I'll just do a audio you check? Try this uh, audio again I have no and see if we're in managing this. Yeah, sounds good, Megan. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you for having me. My name is Megan Vickard. I am the general manager for waste services at CNL. So with respect to intermediate level waste, uh, it is characterized. You can and hear we me now. It sounds it. like I think I'm getting messages that you can hear me now. So I'm just going to repeat, Dave, what I started saying there, the intermediate level waste that we have on. So So intermediate level waste on site, it is uh, processed, it is characterized, processed and packaged uh, to right. ensure passive safe storage like until there is a geologic like disposal Megan. facility I, I don't, I'm confused, uh, available. Um, the LW, we do load it into fit for purpose packages. We optimize the safety of workers and we ensure that we have the right storage capabilities when we need them. So we do have existing infrastructure that will continue to be utilized and we continuously drive to evolve the facilities that we have, ensure that we always have uh, the capabilities and facilities in order to receive intermediate level waste that we might produce either from our existing operations or from proposed decommissioning activities. No, Phil, but just okay. want to check did Thank that. You for that was response, that... Megan, and apologies to the viewers for the audio difficulties we're having off-site there. Um, the next question is uh, directed towards Dr. Jeff Griffin, and the individual is asking, could you expand on the Hydrogen Safety Centre? Uh, what was that about? So, uh, to expand on that, the idea that we have is that uh, as we build up a hydrogen infrastructure for, you know, production of hydrogen and the use of hydro hydrogen, uh, say, in transportation, uh, at uh, in industry, you're obviously, as you create that infrastructure, you're actually uh, creating new, you know, potential hazards associated with that. So it's to really try to help the industry, the, the producers, the end users, um, uh, the regulators to, to be able to come together and understand what some of the real challenges are, what some of the opportunities are uh, as we go forward on this. So it's a, it's, well, hydrogen itself, of course, is not new, and the utilization of it is not new. On a larger scale, it presents new potential, new challenges, and the idea is to sort of be able to bring uh, everybody together to kind of work through this, uh, identify those opportunities, uh, help uh, perhaps shape research that's done, studies that are done, uh, that sort of thing. So that's the that's the concept we have right now, based on the discussions with industry and uh, others that, as I mentioned at our workshop that we had a few months ago. And we're going to be carrying that forward and continuing to work with this uh, as we create this hydrogen safety center, Canadian hydrogen safety center. Okay, thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, Joe, the next question is coming your way, and it's a it's a broad one, um, and perhaps again it could be shared. I, I do believe we have uh, Lou Riccoboni online as well. So, considering the planned growth at Chalk River, what what role does ACL or CNL intend to take in the development and growth of the communities that surround? So I actually think that's a, a great question. We touched on it. Uh, I touched on it briefly in my in my opening remarks. The uh, I, I look at our success is uh, will drive the success of local communities, whether it's municipalities or whether it's indigenous communities. Our uh, our investment, uh, the ability to bring more uh, construction projects, research projects, more people. Uh, more interest into the site will, I think, naturally bring more uh, revenue, more interest in the Ottawa Valley, in particular this portion of the Ottawa Valley. And it'll really start to drive, I think, more of a high-tech uh, approach into this part of the country. And, you know, when we look at the value of the construction projects that we're looking for going into the future, and this is not just next year or the year after it. We're looking, you know, 10, 15, 20 years into the future of continual construction projects to support either research and development, clean energy technologies, actinium uh, production or, and transportation, but also equally as important, uh, waste remediation and D&D. Uh, &D. So um, I, I look at that as, you know, our, our commitment is not only to be able to drive job opportunities here, which will 
naturally impact and positively impact the communities. But we also have a, a I think, a duty and a responsibility as, a, as good citizens to be able to make sure that the folks in our community are, are taken care of well. I think we've talked a little bit about uh, our outreach for school programs and science programs. But we also, you know, we also participate in community sponsorships uh, through CNEA uh, in, in yearly donations to specific uh, uh, organizations. Over the last couple of years, and it was really, I think it was a, a market, uh, uh, I would think uh, a really a market statement. Uh, we're, we're provided with uh, funds to support our staff every year. And over the last couple of years with COVID, our staff voted to be able to provide those funds and that support into really a crowdsourcing type uh, environment to support uh, communities across and community and community events across all of our sites. And I think, you know, for me, in the middle of, uh, of a pandemic, our people reached out and not only supported the communities in, in the pandemic from, from that perspective, but also continue to support their own communities with really, you know, volunteering funds that were, were meant for them. And so not only from, I think the CNEA, which is the, the, the parent contractors, CNO managed, but, the, but CNO employees, there's really this culture that, you know, we live in the communities, our, you know, most of our folks live very closely to our sites and uh, our communities benefit from from what we bring. And so I think it's it's a natural harmony uh, kind of going forward. Okay, thank you for that. Very true. As a resident of a local community, I couldn't agree more. Uh, we do still have some questions coming in. We probably have time for one or two more. Uh, this next question I'll pass over to uh, Ali Siddiqui. It's SMR driven. And, uh, and Ali, listen carefully because you may want to, uh, to do some correction on this one. But the question reads, with over 80 SMR designs around the world, what makes the GFP SMR design the preferable solution? Well, that's a great question. And there really are a, a huge number of different designs that are being worked on throughout the world. And I think that the key point there is that there are uh, niches for each of those different designs. Uh, the GFP design is the first one that we've uh, accepted as far along in the siting process as it is. Uh, so they're, they're very close to siting this reactor and building the reactor as we heard. Uh, there are other reactors that have approached us, uh, vendors that have approached us uh, that may look to site at Chalk River or at another CNL managed site in the future. Uh, and we're certainly open to working with many vendors uh, that, that are available um, it is the right size for a small community or a remote site, and that's playing a little bit into their uh, progress here at the Chalk River site. Uh, we may not be able to handle a, a larger uh, reactor on, on the top end of the SMR spectrum, but I would emphasize that there are many designs that are being worked, um, and they have different applications and different niches. And so uh, there are, I think, out of those 80 that are being worked in the world today, which is about right, uh, there are about 12 of them that are active in Canada and are participating within the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission's vendor design review process or are working directly with utilities or uh, projects here in the country. Thank you for that, Ali. And uh, we'll call this the last question. We are running a bit over time and I'll direct it to Joe. And Joe, the question reads, what is the safety plan for Chalk River? How is the facility ensuring the safety of nearby residents and the protection of the environment? So we have uh, a very robust safety program to, to uh, protect uh, our employees, uh, our communities, uh, and the environment. It's multi-layered. Uh, we have management systems that provide guidance to us, guidance to our staffs, to make sure that we are doing what's right, uh, we, that we are doing in accordance with regulations and legislation. But more importantly, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, I'll go back to the point I raised earlier. Our employees live in the communities. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about protecting the environment, it's not just that we're protecting the environment for a company, we're protecting our, the environment for our people, not only on the site, but off the site. We have actually really stepped up over the last few years, our safety programs and our safety progress. 
Uh, at this point in time, we are one of the safest uh, research laboratories and uh, national laboratories in North America. Uh, we've done that by a very, I think, proactive approach to how we, uh, how we do safety, how we involve our employees. But it's also, you know, try, you know the, the, the adage generally is you always want to go home in better condition than you came to work. And we're trying to do that by leading by example at, at our executive level and management level. But what we see is that our employees have really adop, uh, adopted this. And, and it's, it's the right thing for us to do. It is the right thing for, for us to do from, from not only a human perspective, but also from an environmental perspective and a business perspective. And so I'm, I will tell you, I'm very, very proud of what our folks have been able to do and continue to do to keep us operating safely, uh, not only you know, with respect to legislation and, and uh, uh, limits that exist, we are so far below uh, any, any reporting requirements for the most part, uh, that uh, it really, I think people should be very proud to say that they live next door to one of the safest uh, and most proactive uh, companies uh, and research laboratories in the world. Thank you, Joe. A, a very nice way to draw this to a close here. And before we have you up to the podium for any closing remarks, uh, I'd just like to remind those folks that are watching online, we will be posting this to our, uh, to our social media channels. I would encourage you to share that uh, with any interested friends, colleagues, neighbors that may want to tune in uh, and listen to the session. And with that, uh, over to you, Joe. Okay, uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Fred and his team uh, for, uh, for participating in the, the community update tonight. Uh, this is, it, it is a very collaborative uh, working relationship and a very positive working relationship that exists between uh, AECL, the, the Federal Crown Corporation, and CNL as the, as the enduring entity, but uh, as, the, as the operator. I think it's one of the best that I have ever seen, and I've done this for quite a while in, in the National Laboratory System. Uh, I hope that most folks will walk away tonight thinking, wow, there's an awful lot of stuff going on there. And hopefully, wow, my tax dollars are actually being spent very well. And, and we actually just kind of you know, scratched the surface of a lot of the events and the projects and the research and the activities that are going on here. We could, we could spend days telling folks what happens at this laboratory, but what I'd like to close on is, um, you know, is an observation of, uh, of our people. The example that I used uh, a couple minutes ago about this crowdfunding and support for the environment and what our folks did during COVID, that just came naturally. That came naturally to our folks because that is who they are. That is, that is really what CNL is all about. It's about our people, it's about our values, and it's about contributing not only to our local communities, but to the nation and to the world. You know, I, I had the opportunity to talk at, at some conference recently, and they asked me what, what, you know, if I was gonna look at something into the future, what was important? And I, I said, one, clean energy, so that, and nuclear is a, is a key part of that, but also the ability of the nuclear industry to really advance the fight against cancer, to be able to maybe within some of our lifetimes, be able to say that we're going to cure that disease. And I think, you know, when I look at our folks working in the actinium world, in our research world, in our biology world, the ability to make a difference in someone's life, that is why we are here. That is really hopefully why Canada is, is funding us. But we, every day, and I know every day, all of our folks come to work because they want to make a difference. They wanna make a difference for the Chalk River area. They wanna make it for Ottawa Valley. They wanna make it for Canada, and they are. And I would say at the end of the day, I hope people walk away thinking, wow, those are some pretty good folks out there. So thank you. Thanks for joining us. So thanks to everyone who uh, spoke tonight. Thanks to our uh, audiovisual team for, for supporting us. And I hope everyone has a, uh, has a good evening and a good week. Thank you.